Dave, do not look down. Really? I went, what do you mean, do not look down? I stepped in an IED, lost both my legs and my right arm. I, did it happen to me to win these medals? Did it happen to me to meet my wife and have my kids? I still don't know, because I'm still on that path. I'm still on that path to wherever it takes. I'm a young lad, I've got the rest of my life to live. Yeah. I can make something of my life. Okay, so Dave, thank you very much for uh, being here today. No problem at all. Uh, Dave Watson is a great client of Vivid Inc., uh, a loyal client over the years, and a friend of mine as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, you've got a phenomenal story and one we'd like to share with everybody. So that's not a problem. I'll share. I'll share my story with you. Thank you. So yeah, from if you don't mind taking us back and uh, you know from where it all started to where you are now, please, Dave. So two thousand and. Five, I joined the military, uh, joined the Scots Guards. So I, the, the guys what were a tourist attraction in London with the red jackets and bursting hats. Yeah, nice. So I stand outside Buckingham Palace, St. James's Palace, Tower of London, you name it, I've done it. Um, doing that job as well, I got to meet all the royal family. Um, mates with Prince Harry. Really? Uh, I've, danced with, I've danced with the Queen. I've done, I've done quite a bit while I was doing that, that side of the job. Yeah. And then I went to, over to Battalion then getting ready to go to Afghan in 2010. Went over to Afghan, absolutely. Like, I didn't know what to expect when I was out there uh, compared to how they live, to how we, how we live. Yeah. It was a lot different. So we were out there, we were teaching their military and their police how to do all different jobs. Yeah. And then on the 27th of May, 2010, I was out there for three and a half months to then. And I stepped in an IED, lost both my legs and my right arm. So, Taking it back to obviously the horrendous day that it all happened, what was what was what was happening? What was it routine patrol or what were you kind of what was the process? Yeah, well we were going out on a routine foot patrol. Uh, there were fifty three of us, and we were getting into a stream, and now we're the third to last man. Right. So everyone got in, they passed it, and I've got in, I've passed the IED, and then my mate who was behind me he slipped. And out there, there's not, there's no time to really think. So we out thinking. I just turned around, completely forgot, and didn't even think about the AED. Turned around, went to a TV right as I turned around, stepped on it. But from then, it was like, I don't know. Have you ever been in fit, it, it in the face with a football? Yeah. It was like that. I, I, I was carrying the LMG, which were heavy machine gun, and. That hit me in the face, it lifted hit me in the face at about, you could say about 100 mile an hour. Joking. But it was just like being hit in the face with a football. Really? Because it hit me in the face, it threw me 10 foot in the air and I landed back first into the stream. So all the water's come over me. Uh, while I was in there, my life flashed before my eyes. I tried to get made above water, it wasn't happening. I didn't know why, because I didn't really know what had happened by then until the guy would come over, dragged me out, sat me on the side and gone, Dave, do not look down. Really? Went, what do you mean, do not look down? So I've looked, me being me, I've looked down, I need to know what's happened. And my legs were gone from knee down. The only things up there were my shin bones and my kneecaps. So the guys were putting the tourniquets around my legs and the tighter they went, the more pressure what was in my leg. And the pressure made my shin bone shoot off. It was all right because I didn't feel any pain. Really? So it was it all right then, yeah. you know what I mean? No pain. So, But all I wanted to do was just, to, at the time I was smoking, so all I wanted to do was just have a, have a fag, you know what I mean? <laughs> Spitting my teeth out and everything like that, I just wanted a fag. Do you think it was shock? Yeah, yeah. it was adrenaline and shock all put together that I didn't have any pain. Yeah. But when I was just thinking about things, I started getting pins and needles in my arm. And I've looked at my arm, my arm just dangling, you know what I mean? Just being held on by its tendons. 
and me being me again, I looked at it and I'd, I weren't feeling pain, so I just gave myself a high five. Just joking. So it was just like, you know what I mean? And I was just laughing and joking from that day. Really? Mm. For me, every, you know, from the first time that I met you, you were such a positive person. Mm. Um, so, I mean, how, how have you taken that kind of situation, which is obviously such a big, you know, adversity and kind of, I mean, you, you see it in some ways as a positive, don't you? Yeah. Uh, well, when it first happened, I didn't, know, I didn't really know what to expect um, because I was a young lad and I, I was a fit, able-bodied guy. I used to box, I used to play football and then I was missing both legs as well. And I thought, what am I going to do now? I've just been put into a wheelchair. Am I there for the rest of my life? Yeah. So I did go through some dark times when I was back in Preston. I did turn to the drink. I was drinking a lot. Uh, and then one one day, I just, I've got that mindset where if I just want to stop something, you just I'll stop. just do it. Uh, so I was carrying on drinking. And I just woke up one morning and thought, what am I doing? Yeah. I've, I'm a young lad. I've got the rest of my life to live. Yeah. I can make something in my life. Yeah. So that's what I did. I just stopped drinking there and then. And I got into sport, discs and shot put. And doing that, I got told I've got a talent, keep it going. So it's that what pushed me forward. Yeah. And then I moved to Birmingham, met my wife, and she was pushing me even more. So I started with the athletics, doing all my sport. And I was always a keen fisherman when I was younger. Yeah. Doing fishing, and I ended up getting a, a sponsorship with on the fishing side. And then having my kids. Yeah. As soon as I had my kids, I thought, I've got to do, I've got to keep going with this. Yeah. It's them what pushed me. Yeah. Every time I wake up, I'm doing it for them now. Yeah. Fantastic. So, obviously, you've just gone through something, you know, most people would never wish to even imagine, let alone happen, have happened to them. So, I'm guessing then you've been transported to, you know, medical facility. Yeah. Um, what happened from to, there? We flew over to Camp Bastion. I flew back to Camp Bastion. They patched me up. Uh, as well as they could, because I had to get back to the UK and get to the hospital as, as soon oh, as so I you had treatment back in the UK? Yeah, yeah. So they took me to Bastion, they patched me up, they cleaned me up, and then they flew me to Selyok at the time. And as they were flying me back, I died twice at 37,000 feet. You're joking. Uh, yeah, I died twice. But from, I'm still here to tell the story. From like blood loss? Yeah, guessing, yeah, yeah, blood loss and... Just trauma. Yeah. Crazy. So, how long were you in hospital for? How long do you think I'd have been in hospital for? Missing three limbs, just been blown up. I'd want to say maybe three months, maybe longer. You were close with a three. Three it's years? How long? Three weeks. Three weeks? Yeah. You're joking. So three weeks from being exploded in Afghanistan, you've lost both your legs and your arm. And then three weeks later, you're out. Yeah, I'm at home. Having a Jack Daniels with Cork. You're joking. <laughs> how does that happen? From, from your powers of recovery or because that's how quick they had to get you out of there? Or? I think it was my strength as well. Yeah. Uh, my determination. Because a lot of people, you get a lot of people that heal fast. Yeah. And you get some people that don't heal so fast. But I must be one of them lucky ones where I healed and I were home. Yeah. And then I went from that, I went home for two weeks, seeing my friends, seeing my family, going out, having a drink. Because uh, I had a drink for three and a half, well, nearly four or five months. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and then down to Headley Court, starting my rehab. Really? Okay, so rehab, how, how, how was that process? I can imagine painful. I can imagine hard. hard yeah. Uh, so, do you know what I mean? I was stuck in bed for like two of them, two of them weeks, not going, to, not going out, um, and losing your legs, and they just tried down at Headley Court. It was like still military, yeah, but they still did the stuff they do with an able-bodied person, right? So we had to do that. Uh, so getting up at half past seven in the morning, you joking? Circuits for an hour for the first thing. <laughs> They were just, and like, I understand it now, 
But back then, when I first got injured, I didn't think they were. I didn't think they were treating us right. But look at me now. Yeah. It's all thanks to the medics and yeah. that team at Headley yeah. Court. So, was there ever any times, you know, say for example, the first night when you were on your own after all this had happened? What was what was going through your mind at, at those times? You kind of always been so, you know, strong minded about it. Yeah. So when I was in hospital. When I got put onto the wards after being in critical care, I was in the bed space next to the window. And it's 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 strange because I was back in the UK, but because of all the meds I were on and all and everything like that, every time I looked out the window at, at night when I woke up, all I was seeing was Afghan. Really? And like our stag points and everything like that. And there were a guy on there and I was like pretend like thinking, I was looking at me watch, thinking, well, he'll be waking me up in a minute. It'll be my turn to go up and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I was seeing that a lot. I think that would be because of the meds and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and not really knowing from when I got, from when I got blew up, I got put to sleep on the flight back to Bastion. Yeah. And then I woke up. Yeah. In Birmingham. So at one minute I'm in a conflict zone. Yeah. And the next minute I'm next in a hospital minute. bed. You don't even really remember exactly what happened because obviously the weapons hit you in the face. Yeah. And then from that, and then you're back in the UK. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, so I was just looking out the window, I was seeing Afghan. Um, but I've, the good thing, of, well, it's not, it's not, it's good for me, but I haven't struggled with PTSD or anything like that, or yeah. I don't get flashbacks really. Right, okay. The only time I had a flashback was me and the wife was watching that Kajaki. Uh, it were a military, a British military film that what come out a couple of few years ago. Yeah, and it were a true story. So we were watching that, and that were exactly the same as why now we're out there. Oh really? All the IEDs, all the gunfire, and I was sat there watching it, not twitching, not doing nothing. But then when I'd gone to bed, yeah, the wife, like I'd gone to sleep, and the wife, well, told me in the morning. That I was shouting for my weapon, I was shouting for my really? boots, I was doing this, I was doing that, uh, like contact front and all that lot. So it was that what did it yeah. that night. But since then, I've been watching military films and nothing's really happened. Yeah. I mean, that's incredibly fortunate, isn't it? For mm. in, in one way. I mean, have you have you have you done any work with people who have PTSD? Well, I haven't done. I've, I helped to I helped to one of my mates out. Uh, one of my mates, all close, we in the Scots Guards. Um, we weren't together at the time, but we were that close when we were in battalion. When he found out this happened to me, he just he went a bit, yeah, a bit funny. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, he come to see me, and he's R and R, and he's resting recuperation. So he got two weeks off from Afghanistan. He come home. He come to see me. Send me in an hospital bed. And then he's gone back. He's gone back home. He's ended up getting arrested that night because his really? head just gone. Head's gone. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, he won't mind me saying this, but he did get sectioned, right, uh, with PTSD and every, all that, all that stuff. But every time he seen me, it was me what was triggering it. Yeah. So yeah. the only thing I thought of, because he weren't far away from where I used to live in Preston, he were only, he were only in Darwin. It was me going to see him every day. Yeah. Just sitting there for three, to... four hours because yeah, yeah. he, he has to see what's happened to me, how I'm coping with it and what my life yeah. is like now. Yeah. And he did get used to it and I have helped him out a lot because I got him involved with the Invictus games and everything like that. Yeah. And Nice. Yeah. I mean, it's, I still just find it such a crazy story. You know, you, you see these things on films all the time. All, all the time and you kind of can't you understand it but you don't really see it until you speak to someone like yourself and, and I you talk s- about it like it's just natural uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and that's the crazy thing about it you know you, you see you've got such an outlook on it where it's almost <coughs> normalised for you and uh, it's just it's so not normal for somebody to have such a positive outlook when something you know from an outside perspective yeah, yeah. would be so catastrophic if that makes sense because you, you've just you've just got a like with me when it when it when I first when I stopped the drinking and everything like that, and I wanted to look forward and start doing stuff with my life, I used to set myself little goals. So I used to set myself like one goal a year, yeah. reach that goal, set two for the next year and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
but I weren't that stupid where I'd get to double figures and I'd set myself 15 targets yeah, to do yeah, yeah. in a year. Yeah. I'd set myself a bigger a bigger target than I've set yeah. what I've set before and make sure I reach said targets. Yeah. And that's what I've done and that's what I'm still doing now. That's what you're still doing now. So the Invictus Games, how did you get involved uh, with the Invictus Games? Uh, well, I would help free rows have a big part in the Invictus Games. So I was part of L3 Road with being injured. And I was trading at the time. And I thought, right, I'll, I'll go off the Invictus Games, give it a go, see what see what happens. And then that will spur me on for later on in life when I go for a Paralympics. Yeah. Uh, so I went for the first Invictus Games, didn't get selection. Went for the second, didn't get selection. And then I went for the third one. Went for the third one. I got selection, which were over in Toronto in 2017. And then I did, what did I do? I did discs and shot put, my main, my main sports. Yeah. Because that's all what I wanted to do there. Yeah. That's all I knew. And them sports were on the first two days. So we did shot put first and I got bronze in shot put. I haven't got that with me, but that's in a that's in a frame at home. Nice. Um, so I got bronze for that, and then I did discus the next day, and I got gold for discus. That's at home in my frame as well. Yeah. And from that, because mine were the first few days, I had like a week and a half without doing anything else. Yeah. So I was going along supporting the rest of the lads and all, the rest of the team and that. And I was I was just what, sat there watching, thinking, well. I can do that, and I can do that, and I can do that. And I thought, right, I'm going to go for the next one. Yeah. So I put my name forward for the next one. I got selection, and I did the indoor rowing on top of my discs and shot put. And the the disc, uh, the rowing, sorry, they were, that were on the first two days. And I got, for the four minute and the one minute, I got two silvers, which I've got here. Fantastic. Uh, and then... A few days later, it was the athletics. I had shop on the first bit, discus on the second. What I wanted to do with that, because I was training so hard to up my bronze to another medal, and I upped it to a gold. And so I, I was the Invictus champion for shot put. And then for the discus, I wanted to remain yeah. the, the uh, Invictus champion. Went out there. And just, I was the last to throw. So I was watching everyone else. I was just, like, I was focused on what I was doing. So you're the champion and last. Yeah. Uh, So I ended up with a gold medal for discus as well. It's unbelievable. And then I I think after that, I did the British Rowing Indoor Championships when we got back uh, in London. And I got two golds for the British Indoor British Indoor Rowing Championships. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So how, how how many years is that after the accident? So I started training. So I got injured in 2010. So. Uh, well, it weren't, it, well, I, I went to a weekend where there's a charity what does Paralympic sports. And I think, I think that were about seven weeks after I got injured. I went to that weekend, just to have a look what I can do. So I tried all different sports, archery, uh, powerlifting. So within seven weeks after the incident, you were thinking of what sports I can do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's mental. Yeah. And I, first one, I started powerlifting. So a full Olympic bar, uh, one arm. So I used to put my hand in the middle of the bar and my PB was 75 kg You're on one arm. Oh, yeah. Uh, but then... I found out that I couldn't do that as a Paralympic sport uh, because she, I couldn't use my prosthetic on my other arm. Right. So I couldn't do that, but I kept up the the weight for my discs and shot books. It was there, I got told, I've got a gift, Yeah. carry it on. So I yeah. did. So with Headley Court, where I was doing my rehab, we went over to America to do like a mini Olympics. And I was doing discs and shot put. And I stepped up for the discus, sat on my frame, I threw my discus, and I broke the American record. You're joking. 
but because I wasn't classified, yeah, it doesn't. They wouldn't let me have. They wouldn't let me have it. But I know I did it. Everyone there knows I did it. Yeah, yeah. That's all that matters, isn't it? Yeah. So see what happens in the future. Yeah. What are your aspirations for the future, sports sports wise? Sports wise, I'm just waiting out at the moment to see if I get selection for Tokyo. So selection for that's June, July. Fantastic. If I don't get that, not a problem. I'll keep training, and it's the Commonwealth. So I mean. How old were your children when, when you won the Invictus Games the first time around? I only had one child. Oh, you just had one and child? Stepson. Yeah. Uh, Aaron were one. Really? And Josh were 13. Yeah. 12, 13. Yeah. They must just be unbelievably proud. They were. Um, my daughter at the time, she was too young to, understand. to take out. Yeah. And, but she did. When I got back, I did get a photo with her with my medals around the neck. Amazing. Uh, but we took Josh out with us. He's never seen anything like that before. Uh, and to get him used to that, and being out there just sat, because he would, you know what I mean? He was a young lad. He was a 12 year old. They just want to play on the yeah. PlayStation and everything yeah, yeah. like that. So I took him to the World Champs in London. So I got free tickets off my coach. Took him to the World Champs and we sat there and watched the athletics. Um, I said to him, this is what it's going to be like out there. And he loved it. He loved it. I absolutely loved it. Nice. Yeah. I mean, then watching, you know, y- your dad compete is just like, it's unreal, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And it's, just, it's something they can go back and tell yeah. their mates and yeah, yeah, so yeah. on. It's like since doing this and winning my medals, I've done a few talks at Josh's school. Oh, really? Fantastic. I've done every year. Yeah. So, and they keep asking me back. They keep asking you back. I'm not surprised. So, I mean, I guess the question that I I wanted to ask you was, you know, you've got such a positive kind of mindset. And and for anybody out there who's maybe, you know, struggling, whether it's physically, mentally, you know, financially, in relation, any of those kind of things, what would your advice be to, to people? What would my advice be? Um... Everything happens for a reason. Um, with me, it happened like I woke, I woke up being like this. Everything happens for a reason. I, did it happen to me to win these medals? Did it happen to me to meet my wife and my kids? I still don't know because I'm still on that path. I'm still on that path to wherever it takes. And what I'd say to him is, do not let it get you down. There's plenty of other things you can do or out there anyway yeah just keep going keep going, keep going. just keep your head high nice yeah i think it's a, it's a it's a brilliant message and and one which you know it's often easier said than done to to implement but you're oh, yeah. you're the embodiment of it at the end of the day yeah look at me and just yeah think just think of me when you when anything happens working you can you can be like me yeah in Months, a month for years time. So now, obviously, you know you, you've got your career in speaking. You do a lot of speaking. Yeah. Um, how did you end up doing that? Uh, well, I started speaking in 2014. A lad who I know who's in the insurance industry, they were having a an award ceremony, and he just asked me. He said, "Do you do speaking?" I said, "Well, I've done a little bit. I'm not brilliant, but he said, well." I want you to tell your story really? at this award. So I did that. And everyone, the room was that quiet. You could just hear a pin drop. But mine's different to every other motivational speaker. I've got a few jokes in mind yeah. as well, just to keep them all them entertained as well. Yeah. And then since then, people keep asking me to do talks. So, I mean, that's the always the sign of doing a good service. Oh, people yeah. keep asking you to do. And I enjoy doing my talks because it, that I'd say that's like my therapy. Yeah. Instead of going to like a head doctor or anything like that, I can go and do these talks. And after each talk, it's like a weight off my shoulder. Yeah. So that's maybe that's how I get around it as well. Yeah, that's true. So do you find that, yeah, as you just mentioned, you know, talking, putting it out there, letting people know your story can help as well? Yeah, definitely. It's always good to talk. It, helps, it? it helps me yeah. and it helps people I'm talking to. So... What what would you say now gives you, you know, your main satisfaction in life now? 
my main satisfaction are my kids. And that I'll, I always will be now. Yeah. Um, that's the reason why I get up in the morning. My kids, that's why I do what I do now. For my kids and for them to go to school. Cause I know a lot of people have been injured. They've got kids and yeah, some of them have got PTSD. They lock themselves away and they draw photos of the family, but the dad in the corner. Yeah. Because they're not mm. talking and that. Uh, I don't want that for my kids. I want my kids to put me in the photos. I want them to go to school and go, my dad does this. My dad's a gold medalist. My dad yeah. like, is a speaker. I don't want them to go to school and go, my dad just gets up, he opens a beer and he watches loose women in the morning. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I don't want that. I want them to be proud of me. Yeah. Well, I can imagine they couldn't be any prouder of you. Um, the the so. way they are at the moment, I don't know, but the, t- the test. Well, generally, yeah, generally, yeah. But yeah, you can you can just you can just see uh, they are proud. They do understand because when I when I won my medals, um, the nursery what my daughters went to, the all the kids there, they all chipped in and made this this big gold medal. Really? Yeah, out of, out of cardboard and that. Fantastic! It was, it was brilliant. Yeah, I saw the picture of you with your um, with the well done daddy medals as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, me oh, daughter, is that the same one? Me, well, they they, had, they did a big medal, it was massive it were. Oh, really? And then they did that. My daughters did that one separate. Fantastic, nice. It were it just one of them touches. You know, I what bet I mean? it touched the spot, didn't it? That's yeah, just what you want to see. It looks it looks good on the photo as well. Having medals there with yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that yeah, picture. it's a fantastic picture. It really is one that you know one in however many thousands upon thousands upon yeah. thousands of people get to, get to receive. So, yeah. You should be immensely proud of yourself, Dave. And, and I hope you are. I really do. I am proud of myself. Um, like I said before, I just, like when it first happened, I turned to the drink and I thought that was my life. Then. Yeah. Just going out. You know what I mean? I, I could have been dead from the drink or I could have been dead from this from, happening. You yeah. know what I mean? No one knew. But, Stopping drinking and doing what I'm doing now, there's no, I didn't think I'd be doing this. Yeah, definitely. It's a great message, you know, how you can overcome adversity. Oh, yeah, and um, I've still got plenty of years ahead of me. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, in closing, you know, I'd just like to say to you, thanks for doing this. You know, no I problem. think it's, um, it's a phenomenal story, which, you know, more people need to hear about and more people need to hear your talks as well. Um, yeah because you've got an amazing story and everyone deserves to hear it and I wish you nothing but every bit of success you could possibly have going forward. Thank you very much. Much appreciated.